this idea that other countries should not worry about what we do because we are a stable, mature, peace-loving democracy and we do not mess with other people's fans. But th this still carries power in DC. I, I promise you, it still carries a lot of power in DC. And yet for those of us, especially in your position, Pascal, we know how much this does not pass muster outside of the United States. Like, like it, I mean, it that, that is a delusion. That's a delusion, <laughs> self-delusion about... Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I have the pleasure of doing an update with my uh, colleague and friend, Matthew Croston. Dr. Matthew Croston is an expert in Russian foreign policy at Bowie State University, where he serves as the director of the Academic Transformation Division. And we've been talking a couple of times over the past two years, but the last time we spoke was in, uh, in August 2023. It's now June 2024, and a lot of things have happened. Uh, Matthew, um, in my perspective, everything has only gotten worse, and it especially got worse for Ukraine. It got worse for NATO, and it got worse in terms of escalation. Uh, we are now at the point where, where uh, basically all the NATO countries have given their okay to uh, to use their weapons, officially, officially use their weapons to shoot against uh, Russia proper, not just the disputed territories like uh, uh, in, the, in the Donbass and, and Crimea, but Russia, Russia proper, maybe even even uh, Belarus. Some people have been have been uh, uh, thinking mm. about that, although uh, I think I think it is the, the Brits who. Uh, no, no, I, 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 maybe that was just analysts who said that, but we have official okays also from Olaf Scholz to use German weapons now. Uh, we have talk about boots on the ground. Uh, the, the Ukrainian uh, military has been decimated. I mean, this is getting worse and worse, and nobody seems to be p uh, picking up uh, Vladimir Putin on his very on the various occasions when he said that uh, we can go to the negotiating table based on the East, on what has been reached in Istanbul, but taking into consideration the the realities on the ground. Uh, the Russians has been have been saying that time and time again, and um, nobody's picking them up on that. Uh, even the this peace conference thingy in Switzerland uh, uh, is is designed to exclude the Russians. Yeah. You are a Russia expert, and you keep looking at Russia from the United States. What is my perception correct? Do you share that assessment or how do you view how things have developed over the last nine months? Well, it may have been August of 2023 that we last spoke, but you and I also spoke, I think it was literally only a, like a couple of weeks after the initial special military operation began. And it is uh, the term I've used most here in the United States has been, it's become to me uh, theater of the absurd. Uh, and if I may be dating myself, but if people remember the old English comedy troupe Monty Python, there are certain things about this conflict that if it weren't for the fact there was so much death and destruction involved, it would absolutely be fodder for like comedic routines that would last for eternity. Just the simple idea of what you just mentioned, the idea that we're uh, pushing a peace summit <laughs> in Europe, but for a peace summit that is about Ukraine and Russia but Russia is not invited to the peace summit. So <laughs> this sort of just that just is the first step. I was going to come into this this uh, concept a little bit later, but uh, you mentioned in your really great introduction uh, something that ties right into this thing I've been working a lot on lately, uh, this concept of military creep. And in military creep originally for this conflict, it was a Western concern and Central and Eastern European concern about Russia, namely meaning, listen, everyone, you know, this is not really just about Ukraine for Russia. If Russia is successful in Ukraine, it will be emboldened and it will get more audacious. And then pretty soon Poland should be worried and Hungary should be worried and the Baltics should be worried. Maybe even Finland and Sweden can be worried. That was the version of that concept of military creep that we were fed very regularly. Uh, yeah, the, nar the, first... the narrative that we need to defend Ukraine in order to defend ourselves, Ukraine is defending all of us, otherwise the Russians will end up at the Atlantic in Portugal, right? Right. And for me, uh, where, I, where I do most of my work and where at least largely where my work is considered valuable is in the fact that 
I've always been really good at sort of documenting and trying to talk about what is the perception and the perspectives from the Russian side. This is not phrased in a way to say I support the Russian perspective or that I believe in Russian perceptions, but I do uh, sort of endorse the fact that if we're not aware of what those perceptions and perspectives are, we're going to be handcuffing ourselves from a strategic and diplomatic angle for sure, especially when it concerns ending any kind of military or violent conflict. And so the Russians say, okay, you want to talk about military creep. Let's look at it from our side. <laughs> we who are who have been now fighting and pretty much relegated exclusively to this sort of the eastern 15, 10, 15 percent of Ukraine. And we have not advanced further from that. We dabbled in the beginning towards Kiev, but then quickly pulled back. And we've largely stayed within those two uh, Russian dominated republic areas. So while you talk about our mission creep and our military creep, the Russians look at it and say, let's see, well, first, what did we have? First, we we have the West actively giving weapons to Ukraine in order to fight this war. Second, we see them give more weapons <laughs> to Ukraine to keep fighting this war. Third, we see advisors getting sent into Ukraine in order to train Ukrainian troops on how to effectively and with deadly force utilize all these weapon systems that are being put into, imported into Ukraine. Fourth, we have had intelligence teams literally almost permanently embedded inside of Ukraine in order to give them the most effective strategic information and data in terms of operational capacity on the Ukrainian side. Fifth, maybe, as you mentioned in your introduction, some, some nations in, in Central and Eastern and, and, and Western Europe have started talking about maybe we should consider sending some troops in the Ukraine on the ground to help shore up Ukrainian troop numbers. And then finally, in the last week or two, they've had this sixth version of maybe we should allow, it's okay to allow Ukraine to attack, quote unquote, military relevant, legitimate military targets inside of territorial Russia. Now, I'm making all these comments not to say it's wrong for anyone to make these arguments or have discussions about these arguments. But when you have Russians look at these six stages over the last two and a half years, there it's hard. I'm hard pressed to try and ask someone. Maybe the Russians are sitting there wondering, oh, yeah, we believe in military creep, but military military creep on whose side? Who's the one who's been military creeping ever more closely into a Russian area, into Russian strategic interests, towards Russian military objectives? And that has to be noticed because we've always talked about it almost esoterically and sort of hypothetically about what, what Russia might do if it wins in Ukraine. Meanwhile, Russia is looking at actual factual advancement on the military battlefield that is definitely qualifies in their minds under the conception of military mission creep. Yeah, and we had entire conferences. I remember, I think it was in late 2022, early 23. Uh, semi-academic among the think tanks that that actually produced papers, and you can look them up on the on on, on the internet. They're there, like uh, what to do with Russia? Should Russia be broken up? You know, uh, what should be the goal of of the uh, of the West? I mean, okay, foment uh, regime change inside Russia, and then try to break Russia. I mean, all of these concepts are there, and they're out in the open. I mean, nobody's hiding them. I would say that that's also part of this, definitely of the creep that the Russians will probably perceive. And no, not probably, they do, because they also actually actively write about this. This is all This is all being exchanged. And we have Russian thinkers in, in Russian think tanks and universities who are saying, oh, yeah, we... Uh, this is existential. That's why they are saying it's existential. That's why it's uh, the Russians won't just pack up and go home, as the Europeans and Americans keep saying uh, that uh, you know ending the war is in the in the capacity of the Russians. They could just all leave and it would be over. The point is the Russians can't believe that it would be over. Therefore, they they believe they have to keep fighting. Um, well, no, I think that's perfectly said because just today. <laughs> And, and I caught this literally by accident, and it's not really getting much fanfare at all in the West across uh, different media sources and media channels. But the Latvian president, who I believe it's Rinkevich, I forgive if I've mispronounced his last name, but President Rinkevich came out and literally said today, and I got his quote, if Russia feels it has won in Ukraine, 
then the temptation will be for it to continue. And if it feels if it was defeated, the desire for revenge would be really strong. So his point is to say that Europe's security is at risk for many years, if not decades. But this is totally being glossed over in the West. And I, I just, it's amazing to me that if you stop and not, don't read that quote fast and read it slowly, you're like, wait a minute, what did he just say? So the president of Latvia said, it's incredibly crucial that we do not let Russia think it has won in Ukraine. Because if it feels that it has won, its natural expansionist ambitions will blossom and will have that problem all over again about moving beyond Ukraine. However, in the same sentence, the next sentence he literally said today, however, we have to be extremely careful because if Russia feels it has lost in Ukraine, then it will be, it will be hell-bent and passionately thirsty to get its revenge somehow, some way by moving beyond Ukraine. So in short, we've been warned today that if Russia wins, it's horribly bad for European security. And if Russia loses, it's horribly bad for European security. Well, I, so that so is where actually, are we going? That's actually not the dumbest analysis I've ever heard. That's But this is, the reason this is important is Russians will see that as sort of the, if I was a Russian, I would be plastering this everywhere by Monday morning, all over the world, as far as where their allies might be, and especially, say, China, in terms of its supply lines for continuing the conflict. They've looked for a smoking gun because they have said from the very beginning, and this goes back all the way to Maidan. We're not even talking about the special military operation from two and a half years ago. But all the way back to Maidan, they have always stated, this is the Western interest in this has nothing to do with Russian ambition, and it has nothing to do with Ukrainian territorial integrity and national sovereignty. This is all about, from the Western perspective, this is about whether or not you can get away with making Russia feel weakened and de facto capitulate. And that is how they'll interpret the comment made today by the Latvian president, because he literally said, we're all in trouble. We're all in trouble if Russia thinks it won. And by the way, we're all in trouble if Russia thinks it lost. But you know, so if it can't win and it can't lose, where are we letting it go? Yeah, but the the weird thing to me is that the narrative in the West, in the general media, is um, a version of Russia. What what winning means to Russia that Russia actually never, never, never said. Russia very clearly said time and again what they want is a buffer zone and security. They want Ukrainian neutrality. They want to make sure that, that Ukraine will not use, be used as a battering ram against them, as it is being used right now. So what they want to do is to, to destroy the battering ram ability <laughs> of Ukraine, which is what they are doing by, by this war of attrition, which is why they have no problem with the Ukrainians coming in an offensive, because that only makes it easier to, to destroy all of the NATO equipment which they did so and they have said time and again this is the goal we don't want the entirety of ukraine uh the the La lavrov and others said like no western ukraine we have no interest i mean if the poles want they poll they uh, take it i don't yeah. care but so and in the west it I, always sounds as if though the russians want to want to swallow up ukraine and again like well, rebuild the soviet union and that's just nothing the russians ever enunciated so in a sense, that's, that's what where the, winning that's, and losing that's where the sexy That's where the sexy power is in that narrative, mm. is about mm. swallowing up Ukraine, re-emerging as a sort of Soviet menace. Because what you said at the beginning, just now a couple of seconds ago, is always what has been the importance for Russia to say, listen, I don't, we don't, I would say the hell with Western Ukraine. Honestly, I think you'd get plenty of Russians in private to admit we don't even really care about the eastern part of Ukraine we're currently occupying if you would guarantee us that Ukraine would be, according to our understanding, truly neutral in this space of Eastern Europe, right? Where they had a real problem was the idea of Ukraine being completely aligned. And when you say align, they're thinking of it from a code name or a code term for aligned in this case means doing the bidding of the United States. Yes. So yeah. the United States will put its weapon systems in there and it will put bases in there and it will put its troops in there. And it will now be only, 
you know, several miles away from the territorial border of Russia. And they're like, we will never accept that. So if that's all you're offering us as the alternative, and, and the Russians have always said, listen, I don't want to hear from the West by saying, oh, you don't have to worry about us being right there at your border because we're the West and the West doesn't start wars and the West doesn't do things like that. So you should feel safe and secure. And the Russians have always been like, uh, no, we, we don't agree with that. <laughs> and we're not going in that direction. So if you're not going to let Ukraine be truly sort of neutrally independent, maybe it's not a vassal of Russia, but it's not going to be a vassal of the West either. Truly establish it as, as a neutrally independent country. If you're not going to do that, then we'll go in and we'll fight. Yeah, and that's what that's what it's so, always been about. Pretty much. It is. So, you know, to me, the frustrating thing about this is that at the beginning uh, of this of this war, when we first talked, I really it couldn't wrap my head around why neutrality failed for Ukraine, because it was such an obvious, obvious solution, like the, the most obvious of obvious solutions. Um, and I, I I tried to to think that through until I realized, my God, it's the West who's fighting this. The West doesn't actually fight, doesn't necessarily fight to fight fight with Russia, it fights against the neutrality of Ukraine to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, well, and I think, and if I can add to that, Pascal, we go back to that Latvian president quote today. Yeah. The reason why that is so powerful, what you just said, is the reason the West would not, the West will tell you, well, we, we just don't believe there could ever be a truly neutrally independent Ukraine. Russia would always you know, put thumbs down on it and, and exercise its leverage. But the reality from the Russian perspective is the reason you don't want, you ask, why, why wouldn't the West want a neutrally independent Ukraine to operate freely in the, in the region of Eastern Europe? Russia would tell you point blank, it's because the West has no interest in Ukraine operating as anything other than a very convenient launching point if there's ever a conflict with the West, the West would have a leg up geographically, diplomatically, strategically by having a very strong presence in Ukraine and a neutrally independent Ukraine obviously couldn't allow that to take place for the West. So yeah. Russia has always seen that as an answer and, and, and it takes solace in the fact that we'll fight for that. If anyone thinks Russia is literally fighting for the Donbass, that they're losing all these hundreds of thousands of soldiers so that they can say they now occupy a, an eastern slice of pie that goes down to the to Crimea. That's not really where the strategic advantage for, for the Russian Federation is. It's where they've been, been, it's where they've sort of sat down and where they're sort of occupying at the moment. But the ultimate strategic objective has nothing to do with that at all. No, I, uh, the, the, the frustrating thing to me is that the Russians have been saying that all the time. <laughs> Anyone willing to listen to either Lavrov or Putin or uh, maybe not Medvedev, because Medvedev is more or less just a, a, a what's the opposite of a firefighter? A, 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 <laughs> he's, he's basically spraying everything with gasoline and, and putting yeah. a light. And then the, the, An the arsonist. West, <laughs> An arsonist, thank you. And the West yeah. then uses that in order to say, like, look, they're so belligerent. Yeah, that's because he's anyhow. But the others, you know, the 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 ones who are actually responsible for making um foreign policy, they've all been saying we need to sit down and we need we this this you need to talk to us from the even before they started. These do you remember in 2021 in December, these draft treaties that they sent over and uh, that mm -hmm. the West just dismissed. Um I don't know what to make out of that. Uh, 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 and this, so you are bringing it back also to the problem of military creep, right? That both sides are actually accusing the other one of having having motives beyond this war. Therefore, this, this is where we fight. Well, and except I, I think, and the reason why this remains so much more powerfully real to the Russian side mm -hmm. is because the Russian side, like I just mentioned at the beginning of our talk here today, the Russian side can literally point out to no less than six phases over the last two and a half years where the intensification and the escalation from Western involvement has increased. And meanwhile, the, the, the West cannot point to Russia. This is the Russian perspective. The West cannot point to Russia and say, 
you've tried to, you are still trying to take over Kiev. You are still trying to occupy the entire country. You are still trying to just utilize the country as a, a leaping pad over to Poland or over to Hungary or up to the Baltics. You're actually, this is just a first little tool or a step in your effort to reestablish the Soviet Union. Uh, the Russians are able to say, you cannot see actual military maneuvers that prove that theory out. But we can show you military maneuvers from your side that look like you're moving ever closer and ever more leveraging power and influence toward Russia, even to the point where we've had people in the United States Congress uh, talk openly about, well, let's like you mentioned at the beginning, let's just break up Russia. <laughs> so so fighting to the death for a little piece of eastern Ukraine, absolutely worth it. Or And you must forbid Russia from trying to do it. But we could break up the entire country of the Russian Federation and that would be OK. This is um, what drive. This is what pushes Russians into that that proclivity where people in the West would always make jokes about Russians saying, well, they tend to pit, to be paranoid. And that famous line is always the case of, you know, it, it just just because you're paranoid doesn't mean some of your fears aren't true. Right. Like the Russians might in certain cases be paranoid, but in some cases they might be accurate about what they're seeing on the ground, given this this conflict at the moment? I mean, if, I, I don't know, I, if I was a Russian in my <laughs> 50s or 60s, and I would remember the Soviet Union, I would remember having lived in a state that then um, broke apart, actually against the will of the United States, the U.S. famously said, "Like you shouldn't break apart, right?" And and had a very famous speech in the in the Ukrainian Rada saying, "Like please don't break apart," like George Bush Senior in 1991 in August, right? Uh, three months before it happened, and well, they broke apart despite the fact the U.S. didn't want it. And, and now now you're at a point where where a, a very important U.S. senators and so on are saying we should break apart Russia. Um, yeah, I would think like this is actually in the realm of possible of the possible. I mean, I've seen it once in my lifetime. That would be my uh, reaction. But um, again, 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 just sort of keeping consistent from my end in terms of the problem that that really presents is that for the Russians in 1991, they would tell you uh, the ones that are being honest would tell you that really wasn't a Western ploy. There are, of course, certain Western yeah. factions and Western analysts right now who like to keep who like to literally take credit for the Soviet Union falling apart exclusively, that it was just simply American strategic planning that did that over the course of decades. But most Russians don't see it that way. But they would see this, any attempt now would definitely be seen as an outside external attempt to not benefit Russia for sure. This would be simply, yeah. you want to see this, you want to see this happen because you want Russia to always be in a weakened state and to have a lesser place of relevance on the global stage. That's ultimately where for Russians, where this leads to that, that everything that's been told to Ukraine, whether we're talking about the EU or we're talking about NATO or we're talking about the United States once the military intervention began, for the Russians, everything that's been told to Ukraine has never been about Ukraine in actuality at all. It has always been about what can the West do to undermine Russian positioning on the global stage, what yeah. can be done to make Russia feel less secure, less powerful, less influential? Yeah. And that Russia, Russia will fight that to the end of time. Yeah, and and in that uh, for this end, you know, the the US and NATO has achieved a lot, right? Even just this huge wedge that's being driven between Russia and 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 the Germans and the French, the rest of the Europeans. I mean, this. This political uh, 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 fallout will take decades, if not half a century, to mend again, mending the ties between Russia and Germany and France and so on. This will take really, really long time. And strategically speaking, this is very good for, for the United for States. Our business, just yes. our business is doing reasons. great. Yeah. Our um, business is doing great. There is, there is something else, though, I, I would touch upon, because when you talk about the long-term sort of trajectory of this, what how what consequences might shake out. I'm also a little fascinated because uh, in addition to the former Soviet Union, I do a lot of work with China and China has really quite literally been the lifeline that Russia has needed in this in this conflict. And this is what has made the West very frustrated 
right? Because I think the West honestly thought by now, as long as they were allowed to keep propping up Ukraine and Russia did not try to turn it into a truly international military conflict where hey, anyone that's helping Ukraine is a fair target for our weapons. Because if you're helping Ukraine, helping Ukraine means you're killing us. So therefore, we should consider you a legitimate target. Russia has not done that. All right, let's just be clear. Russia has actually not done that. But they were still running out of the right types of munitions, the right types of weapons and supplies. So China coming in and giving a lifeline in that way has really been problematic for the West because it's sort of like they're sitting there saying, well, I don't in a race to see who can keep supplying the other side the longest, the West supplying Ukraine or China supplying Russia. I'm not sure the United States is confident that it can outduel China in terms of that image or that perception of will. But, but I do need to ask you this, because to my knowledge, uh, Russia produces all the essential weaponry, especially artillery shells. They are all produced domestically. So if you're saying a lifeline to China, I mean, trade with China is important, of course, mm -hmm. and certain technological goods like uh I had a I had a talk which will be posted either before or after this one, probably before with with uh, with a a um, an, an expert on on military hardware, and he he said the one thing the Russians um, aren't cap aren't producing internally um, enough enough is microchips, and they've used yes. like twenty eight millimeter microchips from China, which is not unimportant. Um, right. But you know, on in terms in in terms of scale of of like support, like uh, support for the war, this yeah, is yeah, like yeah. on completely different levels, right? Or are you speaking about other weaponry as well? Well, I think I think you're right, but we also have to understand they're completely different physical levels. But the perceptional levels are really, really quite. I find to be quite co-equal in the sense that we know that if if Ukraine did not have the physical support that it currently gets, the war would be over. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right now, it would already have been over and, and probably not to Ukraine's favor. Russia doesn't need that kind of physical support from China, except in some of those important areas you just mentioned. But the idea of feeling completely isolated, especially in comparison to Western society sort of lining up against Russia in terms of what this conflict is about, to have China, because China didn't necessarily, I felt China has gradually moved closer and closer to Russia in terms of this conflict mm -hmm. over these last two and a half years, where it was in 2022 compared to where it is now in 2024, it sees some of the Russian, what we what the West would call some of its paranoid delusions. China actually now sees them also as say, you know what, maybe in 2022, we thought some of this could, could have been a paranoid delusion. But here in 2024, we're seeing some things that don't look so paranoid or delusional anymore. And we don't believe in the West having this kind of capability or this kind of leverage inducing influence as positive for Chinese interests either. And because when we, when this first started, if you remember, you and I talked about this before, mm -hmm. there was a lot of talk in the first year, year and a half of the conflict to say, well, the West is supremely motivated, not just because it wants to contain Russia, but it also wants to send a message to China yeah. about, hey, don't don't look at Ukraine as some kind of lesson about Taiwan unless <laughs> unless you want to take the lesson that, ooh, if you guys get a little frisky over in Taiwan, the West will react the exact same way. And you don't want as it did in Ukraine and you don't want that. So that means you'll leave Taiwan alone. If that's the lesson you're going to take from it, be our guest. Please take that lesson. But I think in, instead what's happened is something quite reverse. I think China has looked at this now and is saying, actually, I think you're trying to send a message to us about just like what the Russians have been afraid of all along, which we maybe would have thought was a little bit on the paranoid side at first. Now, maybe not so much. Maybe this whole thing isn't about Ukrainian integrity or Ukrainian sovereignty. This is about how much you can punish Russia. And that's why you don't care whether Russia wins or loses, as long as you can still create an argument, yeah. like the Latvian president said, to keep punishing Russia. So they're saying, if you think that's the lesson for us to learn, we are learning that and we're looking at it very carefully. We don't think you'll protect Taiwan based on Taiwanese sovereignty or Taiwanese integrity. 
we think you'll only take that opportunity if you think you can punish us because you're you're worried about our increasing position in the global community. And yeah. that's not a good thing to be taking from this conference. And you know, the the one thing that I've kind of understood on in, in analyzing things is that you need to take what Western leaders and so on say about uh, other countries and then think about why they get this idea, right? Why would you get the idea that China might look at, at Ukraine and take lessons for Taiwan? Well, it, might it be because you are looking at this conflict and you are you're you're drawing lessons for Taiwan, and then and then you add in the things that they do not publicly like put out there in big letters. For instance, that in Taiwan we now have U.S. soldiers. Uh, I think they are officially instructors, but U.S. soldiers in Kinmen. Kinmen, and everybody watching online, please quickly Google where Kinmen is. That, that's a that's that's another island. Five kilometers, three miles in in front of Xiamen, like the, the the mainland, and Kinmen belongs to Taiwan, and and China has respected that for the last uh, 50, 60 years, uh, seventy years. I mean, they had a they had a war there in forty nine and and fifty and so right. on, but it stopped. And ever since then, this has been respected, and Kinmen gets its sweet water, gets its its water supply from Xiamen. You know, this is, <laughs> and there's no U.S. military troops there. So, um, and if you do that, I mean. This is pretty darn um, escalatory toward China, but if you're building up the narrative that China is now is now acting in Taiwan the way that that Russia does does in Ukraine, then that's that's very it's very convenient in the way that you can then react to it. So my analysis is that the, that the lessons learned from Ukraine are, are are applied to Taiwan from the American side. But um, what have what how do you see? Well, that? And, I, and I think. Part of this is still, and, and we've talked about this at length in the past, but I think it's still relevant is that, and I think it is often missed given where I'm located just literally 15 minutes outside of DC with my university. The reality is, is there still a lot of cachet as, as even if people who are not in the United States might look at this as no, that, that kind of naivete can't really be taking place in the corridors of power, can it? But this idea that other countries should not worry about what we do because we are a stable, mature, peace-loving democracy and we do not mess with other people's fans. But th this still carries power in DC. I, I promise you, it still carries a lot of power in DC. And yet for those of us, especially in your position, Pascal, we know how much this does not pass muster outside of the United States. Like, like it. And it that's, that is a delusion. That's a delusion, <laughs> self delusion about. But, but there. So you're saying a lot of people in DC believe in that version of reality. They believe that there's always this this certain thing of whether we're reacting or being proactive, right? Mm. With our mm. with our military and strategic and diplomatic power, it's always for the good cause. It's always for the right side. So therefore, it's always, you should always react positively to whatever it is the United States engages in across borders. And that's fine if you happen to be a country that is aligning with those American interests. And if you're not a country whose interests align with those American interests, you're obviously not going to you're not going to put any stock into that kind of worldview at yeah. all, that kind of diplomatic yeah. mythology. You're just not going to buy. And for the most part, the United States can get away with this because, quite frankly, it has more leverage and power than almost any other country. No, but it has. The it real... is the most powerful country on Earth militarily, economically. I mean, in, in, in it has been surpassed in purchasing power sure. uh, by but, China. But but. On other metrics, still like you know, top dog. U.S. is top dog. Sure. That's clear. Yeah, and that's and that in and of itself answers a lot of questions for people like for countries like Russia or China, saying, okay, so is the mythology you profess the real truth, or is the fact that what Pascal, what you just said, the real reason you get away with this mythology is because you still have such a prominent place in terms of purchasing power and economic power and and technological advancement and military might, that's all just old school realist uh, 
calculations of power personified. It yeah. has nothing to do with it has nothing to do with the quote unquote goodness of one country yeah. over the lacking goodness yeah. of another. The, the fascinating to me, the fascinating thing to me is that this type of analysis that we are giving here is a minority view within the West. And you do have Absolutely. a majority view that buys in, that 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 buys into the um the, the delusional narrative, I would say, about about uh, how the US how the US acts and, and what NATO is. And it it is true that a lot of these countries like uh Poland and uh, and the Baltics and 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 also France and so on. They are they are highly belligerent and they do say no 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 NATO is, is the most important and best thing in in the world and and they they belong together to this epistemic bubble and then you have others which are outside of that including of course the Chinese the Russians but also the well the Indonesians don't buy it the uh, Southeast Asia right. doesn't doesn't buy it Africans and <laughs> Latin Americans don't buy it um but the thing to this group and as you correctly said they they perceive everything as not not with them is against them that's also why this neutral position is something that they can't really accept <laughs> so. and there's and there's there's always the, they'll always feel in this particular mm. instance and this is one of the things that i think china i don't believe china would do when it comes to taiwan and it would be an interesting play mm. um, in terms of strategic diplomacy is that russia did in fact invade ukraine and for people on the side of United States diplomacy, the United States national security interests, that's always the ultimate trump card, no pun intended, no reference to American presidential races. It's always the ultimate card to play. It's like, well, even if you were nervous about NATO overtures to Ukraine, or even if you were nervous about some things that were promised from the EU towards Ukraine, or even if you didn't like some of these speeches coming out of the United States Congress about Russia in regards to Ukraine, the reality is you invaded. And as soon as you invaded, that eliminated yeah. any any position you had whatsoever. This is in the minds of Americans. Yeah, right? yeah. As soon as you invade, you no longer have any kind of moral legitimacy whatsoever. And again, I just try. It's It's obviously sort of spitting into a typhoon a little bit sometimes, is that... The Russians still have strategic interests. They still have diplomatic positions that they have to press forward. Whether you like the fact that they invaded two and a half years ago or not really is immaterial to those interests and objectives. It's the same way as sort of like when, when you have that Latvian president saying, we must keep Russia weak if it wins, we must keep Russia weak if it loses. And Zelensky has literally been on a whirlwind PR world tour for two and a half years to keep getting more support and more support because he knows better than most, even if he won't admit this publicly, that quote unquote, there's always that third option, right? If it's not victory, it's not defeat. Maybe it's just stalemate. We just stalemate where we are at the moment, just stay yeah. there for eternity. For him, that would be, that would be a defeat because he'd be like that part that you are currently occupying in Eastern Ukraine, it'll just go the way of Crimea. And yeah. that means we lose. That means we lose. So he can't allow that either. I so, mean, after after hundreds of thousands of of dead and and two years of war, I don't see a way in which in which for Ukraine anything that comes out of this can can be a victory unless they actually manage to kick out kick out Russia completely. But this. A good, a good colleague of mine, Heinz Gertner, once said, look, Ukraine is either going to be permanently neutral or permanently divided. And it seems that the West is going rather for option number two than number one, because permanent well, division yeah. is... While, is trying to like... convince, while trying to convince people they're for option number one. Yeah. But just hoping yeah. they can they can fool people that they were for option number one and they've been forced to do option two. But all of their actual maneuvers have kind of forced option two. Uh, yeah. It's just the way yeah. it is, because like that's the other thing is like we have this stalemate or this sort of the you, I know well, you have so much expertise and so much uh, fant fantastic publications in dealing with like neutrality and diplomacy. It must be frustrating because I feel like diplomacy is almost true. The understanding of what diplomacy and negotiation and conflict resolution is it, this this goes to die in the Ukraine yeah. conflict. Because right now the two sides still sit after all this time and all this death. They still sit on the position of Ukraine says, here's our negotiation. We will have this end when Russia simply goes back to Russia and gives everything that it did back. 
<laughs> and Vladimir and Putin Ru in The Hague. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Russia says, no, that's not negotiation. <laughs> that's that's cancellation. You're, you're saying it ends if we negotiate our cancellation out of what we've spent the last two and a half years doing. That's not how war negotiations go. That's not how ceasefire agreements get done. And yet so far it's been very intriguing and sort of, and equally frustrating to see that the West or specifically the United States has pretty much backed up that position. Is saying, yeah. oh no, we can bring the Russians in. We can bring the Russians in for negotiations. As long as the, at the end, the Russians capitulate to canceling everything they've done over the last two and a half years and just go back to their country. Like that, because they're not dumb. The Americans are not dumb. They know that might be the one and only shot that would actually maybe create a revolution in Russia when it comes to Putin. If you lose all these people and spend all this time, and in the end, you have to just say, well, sorry, my mistake. Let's go back and just forget about this. You know, you know, um, I often come back to to Japan because the, the way the Second World War unfolded and ended over here is also quite instructive. And it's quite, quite, mm. you know, what the what the what the U.S. and the West at the moment demands um, as, um, you know, a negotiated end, what you just outlined <laughs> is a capitulation. This is a capitulation, yeah. and they demanded a capitulation from Japan. And Japan actually, the one thing that they wanted, even before the before the bombs were dropped, Hiroshima and Nagasaki was like, "Say we want a negotiation, <laughs> and then we we want to save face." And uh, the U.S. actually said, "No, it's going to be capitulation or nothing. Uh, here you have two atomic bombs, and and we fire bomb uh, Tokyo. Are you are you willing to capitulate?" And in the end, they did on the Missouri. In the end, they did capitulate. Um, and in this in this case, the the demand is also Russian capitulation in this in this war, but under the term of uh, negotiation. But this is the one thing that people will not accept in the United States, and yet I have found almost to every man, woman, and child in Russia believes this fervently. Let's just say for a moment this happens, there is a, ultimately a Russian capitulation. The reality is the American narrative from that will be well. We forced that capitulation because Russia invaded Ukraine. Yes. That is that is why we forced yeah. the capitulation. Russia will tell you we invaded Ukraine because the West was always hell, hell bent on making us capitulate anyway. The whole point of what the West wanted to do you to do in Ukraine, whether we invaded or not, was to ultimately make Russia capitulate. And that is a very dangerous thing to have two completely antithetical and opposite interpretations of what, why capitulation is necessary. The Americans are literally always sticking to their guns on saying, it's because you invaded Ukraine, you must capitulate. That was the wrong thing to do. And the Russians yeah, are is, absolutely saying, you were always aimed for our capitulation. Yeah. yeah. So we Which can't is, allow you to have it. We can't yeah, allow you to have it because you were always after it. And narratively, it's really it's really interesting. You remember the first year of the war when um, when the, the the sentence or the, the words Russian invasion uh, were always preceded by unprovoked, the unprovoked invasion. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're really giving it away. <laughs> well, and it's it's a perfect. It's that it that really is a fascinating for historians to talk about that. You know, to the victor, the you know history goes to the victors. And this idea is that, as you know, Russia is absolutely passionately convinced. It's almost like it's the area where you, if you really want to offend them and get them angry, say what you just said. It's like unprovoked. How, like, yeah. how dare you say what we did two and a half years ago was unprovoked? And the Americans, we're, we've always been very sly about this. We're very good about this. We'll say, yeah, well, did Ukraine invade Russia? Did America invade Russia? No. And you invaded Ukraine. Yes. So that it's unprovoked. They, mm -hmm. they narrowly define what provocation stands mm -hmm. for. And they sell that, sell that, sell that, sell that. And that's always what drives the Russians insane to their to their accusations of being a slightly paranoid. Uh, what, drive me, what, 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 what drive me insane and people like us to us in the West, it is an insult to the intellect uh, trying to keep that, uh, trying to argue from within that narrative. But I assure you, it is extremely difficult to 
almost to the, to the point of impossible to argue even with colleagues in academia who are thoroughly within this version of reality. The, whenever you confront them with a couple of counter arguments that, that this is not what's actually happening, um, they immediately go angry and then they will change to something else. But the Russians are using so much force, but Bucha, uh, but S S, and that's a way of escaping, like thinking about actually like all the provocations it's, that happened beforehand and so on. It's interesting because I think you can actually see when you look at what some of the some of the deeper in it sort of you have to know how to read Russian to do this, unfortunately, I think because they don't necessarily always get translated into American media channels. But everyone always thinks this is about the territory, the territory. And I think in terms of what can allow negotiate true negotiations to happen, Ukraine is adamant for the in the Western audiences, Ukraine, Zelensky always pushes, we have to have all of our territory back. And everyone thinks, therefore, that's the sticking point. The sticking point is the Russians won't give back the territory they currently have. I think if you read the documentation, you can actually see a sliver of maneuverability, a door slightly open, diplomatically speaking, that shows if Ukraine would legitimately, like as in sign documentation in Russia or in Ukraine or both places, so that it is act and recognized by the international community as binding, that it would do what we've talked about, this idea of neutral independence or independent neutrality and truly no longer entertain being in Russia's words, say a vassal of the West. I, I think it would be, I think it could be possible that Russia would give that territory back in Eastern Ukraine. I don't know about Crimea. Crimea is a little bit more difficult, no. more historically, culturally difficult, but Eastern yeah. Ukraine, I think they could get back. I really do believe that, but it would have to be Ukraine being willing to say, we're not going to try and aspire to be part of NATO or anything else like that. We won't allow uh, Western countries to put troops or nuclear weapons on our territory aimed at Russia. If there was a solid binding agreement where they literally yeah. did that, that would be more important than the, the Eastern republics. I, I, I absolutely agreed. And I, I, I do think there's people who, who, who will say also on, on uh, the side uh, on, the, on the other side that, oh, this is this is illusional because Russia will never trust the West again and will never trust Ukraine again, which is, uh, uh, I think, a legitimate argument. But we have a wonderful precedent in the Cold War, which is the uh, the, the weapons, the, all of the agreements on, on, on weapon reductions, right? And and the, the way that uh, even ballistic missile treaties were made, right? How were they made? You put your uh, signature on a piece of paper, and in the piece of paper, you also define how you verify that that's happening. And then you send right. you, se you, se you send uh, people like Scott Ritter to each other to, to check what's happening. So if you can make an agreement that's verifiable with an in, with independent both party kind of uh, 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 checking institutions and mechanisms, well, uh, that's that's something that works. And we did for eight years, I always tr try to remember, uh, remind people of this one, for eight years, Russia's strategy was not to suck up these territories, it was to keep these territories mm -hmm. inside Ukraine, because they will make sure that on an electoral balance, Ukraine will, you know, uh, politically be condemned to be neutral, because you have all of these voting Ukrainian people yeah. inside Ukraine. So, so it, it made a lot of sense. This was a strategic move. One of the most important things, I think, in any kind of diplomatic negotiation for, for diplomats, not yes. military leaders, for diplomats is understanding not just what the other side needs or wants, but what the other side needs. And at the moment, I still find it incredibly dangerous that you are leaving no option because right now the position in terms of what is the diplomatic negotiation standpoint of the West in terms of ending the Ukraine-Russian war is... Russia has to give back any any and all territory that it currently occupies, including Crimea, which is even isn't even a part of this war. <laughs> uh, so that that's big in and of itself, and it has to not quote unquote not worry about whether or not the future of Ukraine includes being a member of NATO. Yeah. Now, if that's your standpoint, diplomatically speaking, in quotation marks diplomatically speaking in the West of what Russia has to do in order to have this war end, then you're basically telling Russia, you have to basically just tell your own people that however many hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers have died and the whole thing was just a mistake and our fault and we're sorry, please forgive us. There is that no ain't going to happen. 
There's no country that's going to do that. And that is literally, that's the diplomatic position right now of the West. I can get it if that was the military position of the West. That would be the military position. And then it would be up for the diplomats to say, okay, how do I massage this into something else that both sides could be unhappy with, but live with, right? Isn't that the ultimate diplomatic solution? We're both unhappy, but we can live with it. That's not the way they talk right now. No, and that no. is dangerous. It's, the thing is, it's a neocon world. It's a neocon worldview that is absolutely mm -hmm. dominant, and that one is uh, domination at all at all costs. Now, this is the only hope I have actually in this Swiss peace summit, which is not going to produce peace clearly. But to me, the thing is just misnamed. They should have called it Peace Process Summit, because this is going to be the first time that the West actually sits together, talks, and all of them talk about peace, including the Hungarians, you know, including the ones that are not okay with how this is going. And this could lead to a mellowing up of that standpoint, right? That's the only that's, hope that's I have. Said. And then, I mean, you could be right. Over again. Maybe you could be right. And I wouldn't be entirely shocked if there is some small group inside of the main Western players saying, I know this isn't how Zelensky is portraying this peace summit, but if maybe unofficially behind the scenes, this peace summit is really about, okay, we need to figure out how we change our hardcore positions so that there is something to work with back and forth with the Russian Federation, right? That's... If we don't do that, it's never going to end. Yeah, yeah, so it, it will... <laughs> It's the only hope. I mean, it could be that Switzerland Switzerland will be only about, you know, another PR stunt and we all are with sure. Ukraine and, you know, useless. It could be it could be that something comes out that can be bought, uh, can be thrown over or maybe even thrown to China so that, that, that you know, they can do another round of something else. Um, yeah. Um, Matthew Croston, this was a fantastic <laughs> and very interesting talk. Thank you very much for your time. Always a pleasure, Pascal. Thank you. Uh,